Hey, what's going on everyone? Alex here, and I have a really fun video prepared, and something I got a lot of requests about over the past couple months. And that's a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to design a piece of furniture and make a cutting diagram using the Shaper 3D app. And if you've seen my previous video, you know why I love Shaper 3D and why I love creating on the iPad. So today, I'm gonna design a piece of furniture using this app from start to finish, and go through the process as I'm creating it, and I'll show you my workflow within this app. But before before I start, I want to be completely transparent with you guys. This video is sponsored by Shaper 3D and they were kind enough to give me access to the pro version of the app. But everything I do in this tutorial can be done using the free version. At the end of the video, I will touch a little bit on the differences between the two and if the pro version is something you would like to try out, you can get a discount to the app by using the code BEVLISH10. And with that said, pause the video, go download your free version of the app so you guys can follow along and I think you guys are gonna love it. I, I still can't believe that an app like this even exists on the iPad. All right, let's get started. So once you've launched the app, click the Start Designing button in the upper right corner to begin. But before we start, let's take a quick look at the interface. And along the left-hand side here, you've got all of your design tools for 2D sketching to making 3D bodies. And then in the top right corner is the Orientation Cube, which is basically just used to quickly jump to any of the standard views just by tapping on one of the faces. And then you can double tap on it to switch back to the ISO view. Right above this cube is where I can control and set my units. I also have the option here to lock my grid size. I like to lock it at one millimeter so that the grids can stay at that size while I'm zooming in and out. There will be more options that will appear as we go through the design process, but we can look at that later. So for this video, I'm gonna design a nightstand, but these methods will translate over to other types of furniture. And to start out, I'm going to make the four panels of the case. To do this, I'll pick a surface to sketch on, and this is just personal preference, but I normally start with the front face. Click on the sketch function on the left and select the rectangle tool to sketch the cross section of the top panel. You'll notice these dimensions will pop up. I can now tap these and type the final values. Let's make the top panel 750 millimeters long and 20 millimeters thick. All right, once that's done, I'll double tap the orientation cube and you can see my sketch is now a light blue color, meaning that it's a closed sketch. To turn it into a 3D body, I'll tap on the blue surface, which will bring up an arrow that I can push or pull in either direction. Let's make that 500 millimeters. And I want the nightstand to be 600 millimeters tall, so I'll double tap on the body to select this whole thing and then drag it up by 600 millimeters. And voila, we got our top panel. As with most of the things I designed, the case will be joined together using miter lens. To do that, I'll just select the bottom edge and push to create the chamfer. And let's do the same to the other end. And since the bottom panel is exactly the same as the top panel, I'm just gonna select this entire part and select this little plus sign right here, which will allow me to create a copy of it when I move it. And let's drag that down to about 340 millimeters and then rotate it 180 degrees. But before doing so, deselect this little plus sign or it'll end up creating another copy when you rotate it. All right, now let's make the side panels. The process for this is basically the same, and once again, I'll draw on the front face, but since the miter edges are already defined by the top and bottom panels, I will draw the miter ends using the line function instead of the rectangle. And then we'll extrude that the exact same way as we did previously. But before copying this over to the right side, I'm going to cut a dado into it for holding a shelf later on. So I'm gonna select the back face of the panel and draw a random rectangle. Once that's done, I can size it and place it correctly using constraints. And let's set the space between the shelf and the top panel to 100 millimeters. Now to cut the dado, I'll just push the sketch into the panel and let's make this a stop dado and end it about 40 millimeters from the end. And all right, since this dado isn't in the middle of the panel, we can't simply just make a copy of it like we did for the top and bottom panels. Or, you know, the dados won't line up. So instead, I'm gonna use the mirroring function, which you can find under the transform icon. And as with any CAD programs, there are multiple ways of doing this. I find it easiest to just double tap on the part I wanna mirror, and then pick the surface on the part itself that you wanna mirror the body about. 
as you can see, the right panel is sitting right up against the left panel now. We can either double tap and drag the panel to its final location, or we can just use this align function under the transform menu and select the two edges that needs to be aligned. And it's done. And I think for this nightstand, I'm gonna bevel all four edges of the front panels. All right, now let's use everything we've learned so far and make the horizontal shelf. And I'm going to start with the back view for this so that I can use the dados on the side panels as reference. Since the span is pretty long, we actually don't have to get the dimensions right the first time. Just draw it any size you want and then tap one of the points to bring up the translate arrows and drag the edge over until it snaps to the dado on the opposite side. Once again, just push or pull to extrude this shelf. And even though we use stop dados on the side panels, I'm still going to extrude this all the way to the front. And you can clearly see here that the shelf is interfering with the side panels. But to cut away the corners on the shelf, I'm going to go under tools and select the subtract function. And then first select the part that we want to remove material from, and then select the bodies used to do the cutting, which are the side panels. Now click done, and if we pull the shelf out, you can see the corners have been removed. There we go. All right, before we start moving on to other parts of the nightstand, this is the point when I start organizing the workspace. And Shaper 3D has a really intuitive items manager that I used to keep all the different parts of the project separated and organized. The item manager works very much like the folder system on a computer where you can group different items together in a folder. And for me, I like to keep all the items for the case in one folder, the legs in another, and then the drawers in a third. This way I can quickly hide or show certain groups depending on what I'm working on at the time. And the way I do this is just come down here and tap the folder icon which will create a new folder. And now select all the features and drag them into the folder. Unfortunately at the time of this video's release you'll have to tap on each feature individually to select them. And I hope soon we can select everything just by dragging the pencil down or use something like a lasso tool and circle all the parts we want. But for now this is how we have to do it. All right, now let's proceed with the legs. And as I begin to build more and more folders, its uses will be more and more apparent. But all right, anyways, let's get back to the front view and draw the shape of the leg. The thing to note here is I don't actually have to go into the sketch menu to start sketching. I can simply start drawing lines and the app will automatically know what I want to do. And this is what Shaper 3D calls their adaptive user interface, where the app predicts what I want to do next and then tailors the whole interface to fit my needs. And this is just one of those subtle but significant improvements that Shaper 3D has over traditional CAD programs. And it really improves the efficiency of my workflow. Anyways, I'm digressing and uh, let's get back to designing. So I kind of just randomly drew these lines so that I can show you how to use the constraint tools. The first thing I'll do is make the top and bottom edges horizontal by selecting both and then tap the horizontal vertical function. Now let's set the height of the leg to 260 millimeters and the bottom edge of the leg to 25 millimeters and the top edge to 75 millimeters. All right, and then let's set the leg angle to 15 degrees. All right, that's looking pretty good. Now let's move the sketch over to the case, which I can do just by tapping on any of these points and then dragging the arrow. And once that's in place, let's set the thickness of the leg to 25 millimeters. And if you watched any of my build videos before, you know I like using bridle joints to attach the legs to the stretchers. So let me show you how to design that in here. First, let's flip to the top view and then let's hide the case in the items manager so that we can draw on the top surface of the leg. And notice these purple dots here, they actually represent the midpoints of these lines. I'm going to use these midpoints to help position my first line so that it sits in the middle of the leg. And then I'll draw two more lines parallel to it. And to set their positions, I will select them and then pick the symmetry tool. Then let's pick the center line and now these two lines will be centered and equally spaced no matter what dimensions I set them to. All right, now let's push that sketch into the leg to cut out the mortise. But since the leg is angled, you actually have to push this surface to get the mortise all the way through. All right, now let's bring back the case and take a look. So I think these legs will look really good if they sat in like an X formation. And the way I like to do this is draw a line from corner to corner along the bottom of the case. Then if I pick the edge of the case and this line, 
I'll get the angle and it says 33.69 degrees. So this is how much I will need to rotate the leg. And then let's position that to about the middle of the line. Now tap the plus sign and drag a copy of the leg to the opposite corner and then rotate it 180 degrees. All right, these are looking pretty good. Now let's make the cross brace. And I'll switch back to the top view and hide the case. And as you can see, all of the lines that we made previously are showing up here. And that's because only one sketch may be made on each plane in Shaper 3D. Any additions to those sketches will become part of the original sketch on that plane. So it might seem a little messy at times, but keep in mind that these sketches are only used to define the 3D bodies. Once those bodies are made, these sketches aren't really useful anymore. And if I need to make any changes to the bodies later on, I can just make those changes directly on the 3D parts. So to keep my workspace clean, I'm just gonna delete these. Alright, now let's draw a rectangle and make that 25 millimeters wide and extrude it down 40 millimeters. The first thing we want to do is make it parallel to the angle of the legs. So let's select this edge on the brace and then this edge on the leg and then use the line function for that. Now let's pull it past the other leg. All right, to create a tenon on the cross brace, I'm gonna do a couple things. First thing is I'm gonna use the subtract function and pick the brace as the body I wanna remove material from and then pick the two legs as the tools to do the cutting. Click done and if I hide the legs, you can see all the proper cutouts have been made on the brace. Now the second thing I'm gonna do is just click on the surface of the extra chunk that's sticking out at the ends and push it across to remove it. And then let's do the same thing to the other end. All right, there we go. Got our first leg assembly. Let's create a folder and call it leg assembly one. All right, now let's go to the bottom view and make a copy of this entire leg assembly by selecting the folder, tapping the plus sign, and rotating it until, yeah. All right, you notice that when I made a copy by tapping on the folder, it'll automatically create another folder with all of the copied components inside. And since we don't have that many parts, I'm just gonna keep the name the way it is. All right, now let's hide the case again and create the crosslap joints between the two leg assemblies. Unfortunately, we can't use the subtract function for this because it'll just end up splitting one of the legs in two. Instead, I'm gonna use a sketch to make the cuts. To do that, let's double tap on the surface of the brace and we'll just trace out this diamond shape formed by the intersection between the two leg assemblies. Then let's pick that surface that we just drew. All right, sometimes I have to hide one of the assemblies for me to actually be able to pick the sketch. There we go. All right, now just push the surface down 20 millimeters to create half of that cross lap joint. And then let's do the same thing to the other side. Let's flip to the bottom surface, draw that diamond shape again, hide the assembly we just cut previously and make the cut in the second assembly. All right, now let's hide all of the sketch planes and pull the assembly apart and see what that looks like. Oh man, if only my actual cross lap joints looked that clean, am I right? A anyways, uh, <laughs> the nightstand is pretty much done at this point. I'm gonna use all of the same tools that we've been using so far and start creating the drawer box. All right, so I'm gonna start by sketching and extruding the drawer slides first and then use the almighty align function to place them inside the case. So these will actually help me determine the overall width of the drawer box. And remember how I said earlier that the sketches aren't linked to the bodies? That's actually something we can take advantage of here and extrude that previous sketch for the slides and then just adjust the 3D body to make the drawer box panel. Alright, now let's draw the rectangle on this face and then push it into the panel to cut the dado where the drawer bottom will sit in later. And 
And now let's make two copies of this part. One will simply be flipped and then aligned to the opposite side. And the second one will be rotated 90 degrees and extended to make the front panel. But before we make the back panel, let's make the drawer bottom first. Unlike the previous sketches where we just drew on the faces of existing parts, I'm actually going to create a construction plane for this. And that's because the dados are 5mm deep, the drawer box sides are 12mm thick, so the drawer bottom edge actually starts 7mm from the end of the side panels. That's where we need to place the construction plane. And to do that, I'm going to select the end face of the side panel, then pick the add plane function over on the left and then push it seven millimeters. So that will define the rear edge of the bottom panel. And as you may notice already, it's going to be difficult to use the dados as reference this time because they're not on the same plane as the one that we're sketching on. So what I'm going to do is pick the three edges of the dado and over on the left pick project and select sketches and then pick the construction plane as the plane that the edges are going to be projected on. Alright, now let's do the same to the other side. So now if you double tap on the plane, you can see the projections of the dados actually exist as sketches now, which we can simply connect with one another to form the profile of the bottom panel. And now all that's left to do is extrude it. All right, finally, let's make a copy of the front panel, rotate it, and close off the box. And last but not least, let's begin making the drawer front. I'm gonna create a plane first and then project the drawer opening onto it for reference. Let's keep a 2mm gap between the drawer front and the drawer opening. And uh, okay, you'll notice that when I try to change the distance between the two lines, the projected line ends up moving. And if this is happening to you, what you'll have to do is select your projected lines and then select the lock button on the right over here. This will fix the lines in place and then let's try to set the gaps again. There we go, all right, now extrude it to finish up the drawer front. And I guess all that's missing is the handle. Let's double tap on this front face and draw a rectangle. The easy way to center this rectangle is by creating a line from the center of this rectangle to the top edge midpoint of the drawer front. Then select this line and tap on the horizontal vertical function. So this will make this line vertical, which in turn centers this rectangle. All right, now we can set the dimensions. Let's make this 150 and this 25. All right, that looks about right. Now to smooth out these sharp corners, I'm gonna draw an arc, then select it and one of the edges, then pick the tangent tool. Now repeat this for the bottom edge as well. And finally, let's set the radius of the arc to 12 and then use the trim tool to remove any of these unwanted lines. And you'll notice once I use the trim tool, all of my constraints got deleted. So before repeating these steps for the opposite corner, I have to set my constraints again or things will start moving out of position. Alright, finally let's push this shape into the drawer front and create the cutout. So I still have a couple of sharp corners at the top of the cutout and I can actually round these out really quick by just selecting the edges and then pull away to create the round overs. 
All right, that's uh, looking pretty good. Let's go into the final step, and that's how to create a cutting diagram. And the way I do this in Shaper 3D is actually very similar to how I do it in SketchUp. So what I'm gonna do is first go to the top view, and then draw a rectangle that's the size of a sheet of plywood. So about 1200 by 2400. And then I'll make copies of my panels and then lay them flat on top of this rectangle. I normally start with my largest pieces, so in this case, the top panel. Now just double tap, click this plus sign, and drag it over. And I'm gonna just flip it over so that the larger face is facing down. And then now I just wanna show you how the translate function works. Um, double tap to select your part, select translate, then pick a starting point on your panel and then an end point on the sheet of plywood and then click done. Now that the top panel is in place, just make another copy of it and then place it using the align function. It's just much easier to do it this way since the top and bottom panels are identical. Now let's do the same thing with the side panels. Just make a copy, drag it over, rotate it 90 degrees, double tap, and then let's use the align function for this. And since the right panel isn't the same as the left, let's repeat all of that. And well, I think you got the gist of it. And I'm just gonna keep doing the same for the rest of the panels. Well, at least the three quarter inch ones. And I know that if you haven't used this method before, it sounds like a lot of steps, but it's actually really quick to do once you've done a couple of these. I actually prefer this method over like an automatically generated cut list or cutting diagram because this method allows me to play around with the layout and then optimize it to make my workflow more efficient in the shop. What I mean by that is if you look at my layout right now, I line these pieces up so that I can take my track saw, make one cut here and then one cut here, then then take them over to the table saw, set my fence once, and then cut the top and bottom panels and also this group over here because it's the exact same width as these two panels. And then readjust my fence again for whatever this width is to cut out the two side panels. So basically, the less I have to move my fence, the more efficient my workflow is and the more accurate my work pieces comes out. Now that I've got a layout that I'm happy with, how do I get the measurements to show up? And this is something I hope the engineers over at Shaper 3D can improve upon in a future update, but the way I currently do this is just by using the project function. So what I'm gonna do is go to the tools function and then project, pick all of the panels as well as my sheet of plywood, and you might have to play around with the order a little bit, but uh, just do this until all of the panels are blue and the sheet of plywood is purple. And then click done. Now let's hide all of the bodies and what I've got left is a 2D sketch of all of the parts. Well, the 3 quarter inch thick ones at least. And if I double tap on this sketch plane, I'll be taken into the sketch. Now I can tap on any of these lines and bring up the dimension callout. And if I just click OK, it'll lock those dimensions in place. And I'm just going to do this to all of the projections. And uh, sometimes it might not allow me to pick the correct lines, so I'll have to pick the two vertices instead. But this is pretty straightforward. And as you can see, once we close out of the sketch, the dimensions will disappear. But if you double tap on the sketch plane again, the dimensions will come back up. All right, and that is pretty much my workflow. And I wanna mention that everything I've done up to this point can be done using the free version of the app. But if you have a pro version, there are a few more things you can do past this point. The first is the ability to change colors of each work piece. And this isn't just something to make things look pretty, but you know, you can if that's what you want. But I actually use the colors to help me identify the pieces on the cutting diagram. So whatever the color of a piece is on the cabinet, it'll also have that same color on the cutting diagram. And the work pieces that are the same size will also have the same color. This probably isn't necessary on a small piece of furniture like this one, but as you start designing larger pieces, this is something that will really come in handy to help keep things organized. And the second thing the pro version allowed me to do is to export my cutting diagram either as the DWG or or a DXF file and include the dimensions in the drawings. And then I can just open it on the computer and print this out as a PDF or make it into a more professional engineering drawing, which probably isn't really important as a hobbyist, but if you're working in a collaborative environment with others, this is likely a function that will get used a lot. 
And speaking of integration with other softwares, the Pro version of the app allows me to export in other formats such as IHS, STEP, or STL. And if you follow me on Instagram, you might have seen that I designed a little model in Shaper 3D while I was in the shop building a media console. And I was able to export that as a step file, send it over to Fusion 360 to generate the G code necessary to cut it out on my CNC. So if integrating Shaper 3D with your CNC or 3D printer is something that you value in your workflow, definitely give the Pro version a try. And don't forget, you get 10% off of the Pro subscription by using the code BEVLISH10 at checkout. Guys, I hope you enjoyed my Shaper 3D tutorial on the iPad. If you haven't yet, be sure to download it in the App Store and follow along with this video and judge for yourself whether or not this app is worth it or whether or not this will make a difference in your workflow. It's free, so you have nothing to lose while gaining a whole new tool in your tool belt. If you guys have any questions about the app or my workflow, drop a comment below or shoot me a DM on Instagram and we'll chat. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Peace.